So there's 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is a uh, different gospel uh, than the other three gospels in the sense that those three have a lot of synergy and they talk about a lot of Jesus's three-year ministry. The Gospel of John doesn't do that exactly. And of course, John wrote this when he was um, well up in his ages. So it was the last of the gospel accounts that was written. And, and he wrote it particularly to highlight what the gospel is all about, which is love. And so we're going to focus exclusively on uh, certain parts that took place right after uh, Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. And it kind of will give you an account of things that happened um, during a week, but yet more specifically during a couple of days. Uh, and that's really what the Gospel of uh, John, the latter part of it, captures. And so we'll start right out with uh, up to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. In the Gospel um, account, it talks about Jesus and, you know, he's the light of the world and how he came upon the scene and how Mary, his mother, said, you know, make wine. There's no more wine. He says, it's not my time yet. And it progresses all the way through to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, Jesus actually makes his triumphal, um, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And he spends a little time talking to his disciples to really explain to them what he's going to be facing. I am going there. They're going to do a mock trial, and I'm going to be killed. And this was really tough news for his disciples. Now we're near the very end of Jesus's um, earthly ministry before uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we're going to uh, go to the next chapter, which is in 13. It says, when washing his disciples' feet after eating the Passover dinner, so you know that you'll find that different account in the different gospels. But here we see how right here in, in John 13, which is in the middle of uh, this gospel, he starts to talk about uh, the, the end. So he gives us a longer account, John does, of what happened uh, with much more detail. And here he is. He washed his disciples' feet after the disciples um, sat down to have this the Passover feast with him in the upper room. And Jesus tells them that he's about to be betrayed now. He had already explained it to them what was going to happen, and now he's telling them directly, I'm going to be betrayed. He then tells them to love one another. That this is the most important thing that my disciples can do, is to love one another. He wasn't talking about the whole world because he knew the whole world doesn't listen. He was specifically talking to his disciples, telling them to love one another. Well, right after that, then Peter, he jumps up and he says, look, they're not going to take you. I'm not going to let them. And he tells them straight up, I'll lay down my life for you, Lord. And Jesus said, Peter, you know, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times. So he tells them this in chapter 13 and then moves into chapter 14. And G this is all during the same discussion, the same event time. Jesus then tells his disciples about his father's mansion and how he is the way, the truth, and the life. So he's sitting there in, after dinner on the Passover where he washed their feet and Peter did the, the you know, Saying, I'm going to I'm going to protect you and save you. And Jesus said, you know, you're going to deny me. And now he tells him about, hey, I'm going to the father. I'm preparing a place for you. My father has, you know, many rooms in his mansion. And I am the way and the truth and the life to enter his mansion. That's really what he was telling them. This is your good news message that you're going to go out and tell all the people. This was in John 14. And in John 14, he also speaks of the promise of the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit. He also concludes in this chapter where he speaks of the peace that he will leave them if they remain with him. And a lot of people miss that. Jesus really was telling them, do not leave me. One of you is going to betray me. 
He said that clearly. But the rest of you remain with me. And he's giving them their message. Now in John 15, uh, we know that Jesus shared with his disciples that he's the true vine. And over and over again, he says, if you remain in me, he says, I'm the true vine, remain in, in him, uh, that there is no greater love than that of the Father. And then he says, remain in that love. He is making a great appeal to his disciples who will be his apostles. You must remain in me. And that the world will hate all of those who are his true disciples. So Jesus now brings us up to uh, John chapter 16. And unless you had all that context, you'd be like most people. You just read some scripture out of the Bible and you just use it in whatever context it fits or you want to use it in. But we have to put in context what Jesus was saying and why he was saying it and when he was saying it. And so the very first verse in John chapter 16 tells us of all the things that we just spoke about after Jesus washed their feet and then he told them all these things. He says, I have told you these things so that you will not fall away. Once again, he's stressing, do not fall away. Well, if it weren't possible for people to fall away, Jesus would never have spoke about it. But of course, today, people like to whitewash that, and they like to make the narrative fit an agenda that works well with what they want to believe. But Jesus was clear on that. He said, I've told you these things so that you will not fall away. You know, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. They're not going to let you be in there like they tried to kick me out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will actually think he's offering a service to God. We rid the world of this madman. That's what they thought when they killed Jesus. And they're going to think the same about his disciples. They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. You know, they might know their religion. They might know their doctrines. They might know their practices, their ceremonies. But they didn't know Jesus. And they didn't know God. But I have told you these things so that when their hour comes, you'll remember I told you about them. You'll recount this conversation. And I'm sure they did, because you know, after Jesus' ascension, that all of the apostles, his disciples who he's talking to here, ended up giving their lives to martyrdom for Jesus' name. And he says, I did not tell you these things from the beginning. You know, a few years back, when we first started, when I called you and I said, follow me, I didn't tell you these things then. Because I was with you. I have the certainty that Jesus is leaving. He knows that he's leaving. And he says, I didn't say it when I knew I was with you. Now, however, I am going to see him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Instead, your hearts are filled with sorrow because I've told you these things. But I tell you the truth. It is for your benefit that I am going away. You know, we wouldn't have a life in Christ today if Jesus had not sacrificed himself as a lamb. He said, unless I go away, the advocate, meaning another advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because they do not believe in me. Because everyone in this world that is of this world who does not believe in Jesus are trapped in sin. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me, meaning I will sit at the right hand of the Father and the Spirit will come to this world. And there was an opportunity for people to come and live within my kingdom. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world, the adversary, has been condemned. Now, I still have much to tell you, but you cannot yet bear to hear it. He knew what their capacity was to bear. He knew that if he started telling them the deep things that now that we know in hindsight, 
that they wouldn't have been able to handle it. But he says, however, when the spirit of truth comes, when he sends his spirit to live within them, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you what is to come. You see, that's the prophetic voice of God that lives within us when we're in Christ, and we have his spirit living right directly inside of us, speaking to our own spirit, sharing with us truths, guiding us, teaching us. And this was way before any Bible was ever written. This was what Jesus promised us that would be our true guide, would teach us all the truth. Not that we could pick some lines out of a written Bible and then use them for what we believe or a narrative. And that's what Satan did when he tempted Jesus. But no, that we would have his spirit actually living in us and guiding us and teaching us the truth. And it says, for he will not speak on his own. He will speak what he hears. That's just the beauty of God is to tell us directly. He will glorify me by taking from what is mine and disclosing it to you. You see, this is where faith comes in. If we truly trust what Jesus was saying, then we'll rely on him and his spirit to teach us all things. But we don't do that. We somehow or another think, well, let me go ask someone else. Let me go and look this up. Let me go seek the answers elsewhere. And this is exactly the problem with the Jews at this time who Jesus knew were going to kill him. Because they had God, but they walked away from him because their hearts no longer listened to God. They listened to their picture or their envisionment of what they thought God was. And he goes on to say, he will glorify me by taking what is mine and disclosing it to you. Everything that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and disclose it to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Then some of his disciples asked one another, why are he telling us in a little while you will see me no more? And then in a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. And they kept asking, why is he saying a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Aware, of course, Jesus was aware of what they wanted to question him on. Jesus said to them, are you asking one another why I said in a little while you will not see me? And then in a little while you will see me? Truly, truly, I tell you, you will weep and you will wail while the world rejoices because they think they've snuffed out the light that was causing their evil darkness to, to uh, be in front of them that they could see. He said, no, 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 no. He said, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman has pain in childbirth because her time have come. But when she brings forth her child, she forgets her anguish because of her joy that a child has been born into the world. So as much as she would suffer, she would find joy afterwards knowing that the child was there. So also, you have sorrow now because it's a time to suffer. But I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Just as you're asking me now, he was saying, truly, truly, I tell you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked me for anything in my name. Because here I am, I'm with you. Ask and you will receive so that your, do your joy may be complete. I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech. An hour is coming, but I will no longer speak to you this way, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself 
loves you because you have loved me and you have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. And in turn, I will leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said, see, now you're speaking plainly and without figures of speech. Now we understand that you know all things and that you have no need for anyone to question you. Because of this, we believe that you came from God. Jesus said, do you finally believe? It's like I've been with you for three years now. Do you finally believe? And he replied, look, an hour is coming and has already come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me all alone. You'll leave me alone. Yeah, I am not alone at all because the Father is with me. Now, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribula tribulation. So you see, there's only two kinds of people in this world. Those who are in Christ, and they will find peace. And those who are of this world, who are not in Christ, and they will have great tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. Well, just after saying all this, Jesus goes into chapter 17 of John with a great prayer. And it's recorded where Jesus lifted his eyes towards heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. And then he continued to pray a prayer for the disciples, specifically talking about his disciples that were with him to the Father. And then he prayed a final prayer for all who will follow him. That includes us and everyone in between and anyone beyond us that will follow Jesus and who are in Christ. Jesus prayed this. I would encourage you to go and look at this prayer because it's really intimate. And you think this is just as Jesus knew he was going to be with a father, but yet he knew what had to happen in between. And his anguish comes. In John 18, Jesus is betrayed. Remember, he went to the garden and he prayed and he agonized. Peter then denies him in chapter 18. He's brought before the high priest. There's this mockery of trials, finally to Pilate, and then he turned over to be crucified. And you see, this is just a matter of hours. And we've gone through and pretty much what has happened in chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. John captures a whole lot of what went on with Jesus and his disciples in just a matter of hours, in, in a few days before Jesus was finally crucified, died, and was buried. But we praise God because we know that Jesus was resurrected on the third day, just as was prophesied. And when he came back, many people saw him and he spent time with his disciples. And when he ascended into heaven, he sent that spirit promised in that prayer, promised in those discussions, that he sent his spirit to live within all those who are in him, his body. His earthly ministry did not end when he died. It just took a pause. And he came back and he told them, his disciples, go and wait. The spirit I promised you is coming. And on Pentecost, that spirit came and his earthly ministry wasn't revived, it just continued. He commissioned them and he gave us the same commission. And we live out what we just looked at here, what Jesus spoke of, what Jesus said was coming. And that's an integral part of our lives. So that is John chapter 16.